You're listening to the Business Artist Podcast. My name is Jan Melhaus. Our guest today is Tommy Chung. Tommy Chung is a lifestyle entrepreneur. He has built up a boutique fitness company in Zurich, Switzerland, and also he has a nutrition habit program, Eat Better Not Perfect, which is running for quite some time uh, in Switzerland, but also international. Uh, Tommy is a lifestyle entrepreneur since 2013. Uh, he is a very interesting person and I want to talk to him today about uh, success habits because he's really uh, also he's, on the one side he's strong in implementing habits himself to reach everything he, he wants to reach but also to train people to implement success habits. Hello Tommy, how are you? Hi Jan, I'm doing great, how are you? I'm really well uh, and I'm also uh, happy that you are our guest today. Um, as I said in the in the introduction, you are um, you are very successful yourself in implementing habits. So maybe you can just uh, tell us a little bit about it. Where, how did you find out that uh, just to implement habits is a way to to succeed? And how did you do it? Sure. So first of all, thanks for having me. Of course, I really appreciate that. And I think to to answer your question, we have to go back about maybe more than 20 years when I was still a teenager. Mm -hmm. So um, I um, was very much into basketball and that's the only thing I was doing when I was a teenager. And then one day um, a friend, a school friend of mine came back from one year exchange in the U S and when he left, he was very skinny and he came back uh, looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> so um, that was my motivation to actually bulk up myself mm -hmm. and um, so I talked to him and he gave me a few advices on what books to read we became friends uh, before we weren't really friends um, and then we became friends and I started reading up on self-development books Which and can you give some examples for example sure yeah so I think the the book that really kicked it off at that time was actually a very unknown book from a Swiss author Mm -hmm. called um, The Lola Principle. That's the name of the book. Mm -hmm. And um, it's actually called L-O-L square A. And um, the first L stands for letting go. That's mm -hmm. one of the, that's the first main principle of the book. And um, so L-O actually is in German, it's like loslassen, right? So letting go. And then we have the L square. And the principle of that book is basically L square means love um, square. And he basically says that love is such a powerful um, force that it, it potentiates itself multiple mm -hmm. times, right? So love is super powerful and um, that we need to practice love at all times, etc. And then the A in the Lola stands for um, actio, actio, action equals reaction. So that's a physical physics principle, of course, right? So if you push against the wall with um, all your strength, that same force will push back, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So what you give out into the world uh, comes back to you. Similar, but maybe not the same as to like um, karma, um, but you can see it in that way, right? So whatever you give out, if you give out a lot of positivity, um, you would assume that a lot of positivity, positivity comes back to you in some form or another. Mm -hmm. Maybe over time, maybe not immediately, probably not immediately, but over time, if that is what you believe, then that will highly um, shape the way you live. Interesting so, that you read a book like this when you normally wanted to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did start a training then, of course, right? So yeah. um, I thought I was fit. Uh, since I was playing basketball and then I was so motivated um, that I, you know, put on my hoodie and want to go jogging like Rocky did. Yes. And after hundred meters of jogging in the forest, 
uh, I almost collapsed. <laughs> and then first time I went to the gym, I could barely um, lift any weights. And then the next day, I remember my legs and my arms were just rubber. Like I really couldn't move them anymore. Um, but you have to start somewhere, right? So the hardest part of moving forward is just to start. And once you have that right start, um, that momentum going, then everything gets easier. It's like a snowball, right? You have to pick up the snow, um, actually take snow and use the force of your hands and arms to press that um, all the snowflakes together and make one strong hard ball and then get it rolling. And mm -hmm. from there on, it just picks up more and more snowflakes. Um, and that was the book that inspired me the most. And after that, I started reading and listening to a lot of Tony Robbins um, for years and years and years. So uh, I'm sure you've had that too. When you start listening to someone over and over again, it's like he's like a friend that's by your side yes. and you feel like you know him so well and you feel like he knows you so well. And uh, eventually four years ago, um, I also went to one of his seminars, but by that time I, by the time I went, I felt like I knew everything already. Um, so yeah, it was a funny moment to see him after 20 years. So when did you, when was it, uh, how, how old have you been exactly when you started reading Tony Robbins? Right. So I started about at maybe 15, 16 and started weight training about around that age as well. So before I was very skinny, uh, I had a huge head. And then when <laughs> I left high school, uh, those proportions evened out. I see. So, uh, but it's, I think it's quite an early age to start with Robbie Williams, uh, Robbie Williams with <laughs> Tony Robbins. <laughs> <laughs> I did listen to Robbie Williams as well. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's quite an early age. So do you think that it already had, uh, also had an impact on your, uh, entrepreneurial career that you started reading uh, him so, so early? Um, that's a good question. So, Probably not an answer, uh, probably not a question that I can answer, um, but probably it has shaped my way of thinking as to, I would recite the quote, um, you have to shape your own world um, because otherwise someone else will do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who said that, maybe I just read it somewhere, um, but I was always um, a person who wanted to shape my own world from an, uh, an early age on and if, if you really have that vision then i think every day you will do something to move towards that vision mm -hmm. so um did you did you already have this uh, discipline and also vision and um I would also say awareness when you've been a basketball player that you have to do, if you want to reach something that you have to do it every day. Right. So I think when I discovered the, the whole weightlifting stuff, I started getting more and more into fitness because I think it gave me like on an, on a social level, it just gave me a lot more. Um, I started having more confidence, of course, and growing up in a white world as a uh, non-white person wasn't always that easy. So it gave me a lot of confidence that I lacked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be frank, it also gave me more respect, right? Um, mm -hmm. It sounds very superficial, but eventually it is what it is. And through that confidence, um, I was also becoming a better basketball player um, on the field, on the court, and people, you know, started talking to me about, like, just started talking to me a lot more. <laughs> so um, that's how I started uh, in the fitness space as a fitness instructor, and then later on became a personal trainer when I was studying at the university. Mm -hmm. But um, so after school, what what was your first? Uh after school activity what you did did you study or did you work immediately for yourself or how did you right so after school um after my high school time i went to um the states and canada and in the states is actually 
um, where I really understood that I wanted to be a personal trainer. Um, Cause uh, yeah, I, I just kind of liked the whole fitness scene mm -hmm. uh, that I was in and the gym where I um, worked out at, at LA fitness in Florida, they also had a basketball court. So I always combined fitness and basketball. And that's when I started doing certification and from there more and more certifications while I was studying um, economics uh, at the university. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so, but you studied in Switzerland. Yes, I did. Yes. I came back to Switzerland after my time in uh, Florida and Canada. But uh, during your studies, you've already been personal trainer? Or? Right. So during my studies, I, I started working as a normal fitness instructor. And then I did more and more certifications in uh, medical training therapy and yoga and Pilates and uh, therefore became a personal trainer uh, during that time. Okay. And then after university, did you start immediately with your own business uh, or to, to make it your, your occupation or, or what was the next step after university? Yeah, well, that's a good question because I think looking back, I wish I had started my own business. Um, I actually went on to fulfill one of my other dreams, which was working at Nike, the sports, mm -hmm. sports apparel company. Yes, because uh, I've been a Nike like a sneakerhead ever since I was like 12 years old, and so a, a small dream came true for me, and I I worked in corporate for six years only to find out that I wasn't made for corporate life. Mm -hmm. So I think once you're at a large corporation where, like, which is like some part of your childhood dream. Um, I think looking back, it's very important to understand that if you know what you actually want, then you have to go for it. And it doesn't really matter how great the name of the company is. Eventually you can only do your own thing when you don't have to work for someone else or say yes to other people's decisions that you don't agree on or don't agree with. Yes. So when you've been in corporate uh, and you, you found out that definitely you want to have your own business and don't work for somebody else, did you just quit and do it or was it the process or maybe can you describe a little bit this uh, transformation? And the process was quite long because um, in my second corporate job um, for another large um, American company in the med tech space. Um, I really gave myself three years there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, after, well, after the first, in the first year, I was still very motivated, of course. And after the first year, I knew this wasn't going to be what I wanted to do. And so I gave myself a total of three years. When, why three years, Jan? Because after three years, I would have turned 31. Mm -hmm. And I just said to myself, I need to set deadlines and either you're going to do it by 30 or you're not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, you can still apply the same principle if you're 50 <laughs> or 60. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. But what matters is that you give yourself a deadline, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you get too comfortable or yes. you will lose time. And so I gave myself the three years. And then in the last two years of my job where I was employed, I started, you know, um, networking and investigating a lot of stuff. So I started uh, reading a lot of business opportunities and um, did some small gigs on the side where I was quite good, but I didn't really have or see a lot of potential in it to grow or I didn't have a lot of passion for it. So I think for me to start something, it has to be, like two things together, right? You have to see a potential in it. Plus you have to have a lot of passion for it because otherwise I couldn't get up every day and work on it. So mm -hmm. that's super important. There are other people who would um, disagree. Um, but yeah, that's, that's just how I work. So passion is super important for me. And then after the three years, honestly, I had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I still quit my job because the reason I quit my job was I saved my money throughout the three years when I was there. I went for lunch, had half a chicken, 
uh, and maybe a small piece of bread or whatever, and my lunch costs less than 10 francs, so less than $10, uh, while others would go out for lunch um, in a restaurant, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was always very, very strict with my um, spending habits, and that's how I saved up enough money to say, um, I'm going to go and leave this company and go, I'm going to go out on my own. I can live easily off my savings for one to two years without any problems. And once like one month after I quit my job, um, without having another business or job, um, people already came knocking on my door, right? Because they wanted to train with me and that's how I started. So I was self-sustained from the first month on. How did they know about you, that you do the training now, that they can come to you? Is it, was it all word of mouth or did you do marketing or? Yeah, it was word of mouth. It was like, I started giving trainings again on the side because I was so bored in my corporate job. Like mm -hmm. I was, so frustrated sitting behind the desk all day and just said to myself, I need to get out. And one of my friends suggested like, um, well, one of my friends who had an, a marketing agency, we actually tried to start a startup. And eventually after like all these years, uh, looking back, I'm, I'm glad we didn't uh, succeed in doing that. So we were in, in heavy investor talks already, but um looking back it, it was a very hard model and then that failed at that time so he said to me like hey you're so good at training me why don't you start training other people again mm -hmm. so i eventually did what he said to me because i think sometimes there are things that you want to do but that doesn't really mean you're good at it or you can just take the obvious like do the obvious things and the obvious things is like something that people would immediately pay you for. Yes. I understand. And so, okay. Um, and then you, so it was a very, for you, a very easy transition first because you had saved up money so you could be relaxed and don't have to uh, be self-sustained from the first month on. But actually, you've been self-sustained from the first month on because people already knew you and uh, then word of mouth uh, hit on and uh, they talked uh, to other people so they were knocking on your door so obviously that is kind of a dream scenario but um, you created it yourself uh, with your preparation and with your good name probably in the in, as a personal trainer right well, it was also timing as Bill Gross, um, a, a very famous um, investor and founder, uh, said in one of his TED Talks, I believe, is um, he analyzed a lot of factors of successful companies mm -hmm. and the most common denominator is always timing. And at that time in 2013, um, that was when fitness was started to taking off, also due to uh, Instagram fame. And... Um, yeah, it was just the right time for functional training, for personal training and, and the whole fitness um, trend. So you have to consider a lot of factors, you know, you have to create, I think you have to create urgency. Um, you have to be in the right place uh, at the right time. Did you uh, consider these factors before? So did you do like a analysis of the market and the trends? Absolutely or? not. No, you just Absolutely went for your patients. Yeah. I went for what I have been doing um, a long time ago. And honestly, fitness wasn't something that I wanted to do. I just thought, okay, this will give me some money to actually do what I want to do, which I didn't know what, was, what it was going to be. Um, but then more and more people came. And um, from a small personal training gig, I just started uh, boot camps and other things. So it just grew organically without actually having envisioned, envisioned that at all. And then the nutrition habit program also um, started organically out of the fitness training because you also uh, consulted your clients in nutrition or how did it start? Right. So one thing that's um, a limiting factor when you do fitness training is how can you reach more people, right? Mm -hmm. And we saw that through the boot camps that we did. So we run like eight week programs. 
more people actually come and train with us in the mornings, plus to do a nutrition program and um, personal coaching with us. And the results are tremendous. And we said to ourselves, like, um, these results, how can we achieve these results without people having to come and train with us? Because frankly, there are not that many people in the world who would like to get up at 5 a.m. and train, start training at 6 a.m. Mm-hmm. So we tested, like we took our nutrition concept because everyone knows that nutrition um, makes so much of the results. Everyone knows that, right? It's not that a single person doesn't know it. Um, so we said, how can we make the nutrition program available to everyone? So we went back to our lab and basically tested it with people who didn't train with us and retuned, like refined it and tuned it, tuned it until we had a really good program where we say, okay, this is a standalone program, uh, which we've tested. And now we're official um, nutrition partner of uh, a high profile international bank and some other companies. And we've changed, uh, many many lives already impressive can you maybe give uh, some details about this nutrition program what is it based on what philosophy is it based on is it individual or is it uh, one program for everybody or how does it work right so of course everyone has or almost everyone has done some sort of diet maybe but we kind of looked at what's most relevant right to achieve um sustainable results and we didn't want to add more confusion to the whole nutrition space which is every day almost every day we get bombarded with oh you should eat like this or you should eat like that so the infos that one gets through social media or newsletters or spam whatever is very conflicting right even the studies that get published are very very um conflicting so we just said what is the people's what is what what are people's main problems and let's look at that so we looked at how people actually behave and a lot of people just eat very badly like you know they have um some snacks in the morning or lots of fruits and then some some snickers bar or some chocolate bar in the afternoon and then come home very tired and have a bowl of pasta and on the weekend, they'll have a big brunch with bread and um, cheese, etc. And when they want to lose weight, especially after Christmas, they say, okay, I'm just going to go from eating a lot of bad shit to eating almost nothing. Mm-hmm. So that's the typical yo-yo diet that people do. They eat a lot and or they eat a lot of bad things. And they want to reduce weight and they go to eating very little. For instance, just some salad for lunch or in the evening. Um, So they're not feeding themselves. And what happens when they don't feed themselves properly, their weight will at some point um, stagnate. And once they get a little bit stressed, they will grab a small piece of chocolate. And after grabbing that small piece of chocolate, they feel bad about themselves. (laughs) They eat the entire bar of chocolate. And then they say, oh, my day and my diet is ruined. Then they go to the kitchen and grab even more junk food. And then they're out of the, um, the, their diet again. Right? So this always goes back and forth. And this is what we've seen. And instead of going to going through the ups and downs, we're just helping people to unfuck their diet because People have a very bad relationship with food instead of eating bad hundred percent of the time and then going to almost um, zero calories back and forth. We help people to look at what matters, what small things can you change in your daily routine that are sustainable and that will make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um let's look at the breakfast right breakfast is a very very big topic for a lot of people a lot of people start their day with um let's say a croissant and their orange juice you know how it is right people like to have their freshly squeezed orange juice and are super proud that they're drinking so much vitamin c but you know what a a cup of freshly squeezed orange juice contains so much sugar that people are unaware of and what do a lot of us do they have a large breakfast because that's what we're told 
as children mm -hmm. to eat a lot of carbs and sugar to have energy throughout the day. But our society looks different now. A lot of us go to the office and sit there the entire day. So for us, we're not kids anymore. We're not jumping around all day long anymore. It doesn't make sense for us to pump our bodies with all that sugar just to go to, just to sit somewhere in a, a subway or a car and then get out of that car and sit in another chair and then maybe eat more fruits because I have a low at 10 a.m., etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're looking at these small but simple things that we can change that will help improve people's um, metabolism. And that's uh, why the program is called Eat Better, Not Perfect, because you look at what they do and you try to improve it, but you don't uh, have the aim to, to be absolutely perfect in nutrition. Is that also how you eat? That's exactly how I eat. And if you look at, um, well, we looked at a lot of challenges. Um, I won't say any names because I think they're, they're very good programs. However, we don't think that they're sustainable because a lot of challenges of programs, they will actually force you to eat perfectly like they tell you you have to stick to this program mm -hmm. for six to eight weeks or maybe even longer and that's when people fall off right because no one is perfect and having to abide to strict rules all the time just increase um the failure rate mm -hmm. um so we looked at basically what can we do um, to make it sustainable, and that is to make something not perfect. Um, our formula is 80-20. Eat well 80% of the time and indulge yourself in the ice cream and pizza and pasta that you want 20% of the time, just not every day. You have to deserve it, right? You have to deserve it by um, focusing on whole foods, on real foods 80% of the time. Maybe do some workout go running, go to the gym, etc., And then you can, enjoy your, you can enjoy your brunch on Sundays, for example. So what are the habits uh, you, help them, you help your participants implement to, to stick to this uh, nutrition program? Right, so it's, one example is um, the, the breakfast, of course. Um, but I think one of the most important habits and that's an eye opener for most people is we don't need food all the time. So one problem our Western or modern diet has is it's not just Western, of course, also uh, all around the world. It's the modern diet, right? The way we eat is we eat all the time because we think, Oh, otherwise we'll starve or we won't have energy anymore. That mm -hmm. is a misconception. We're mm -hmm. only eating all of the time because it makes us feel good because food is ubiquitous. It's everywhere, right? It's so easily accessible. And that's where the problem starts. If we eat all the time, if we snack all the time, we don't know what real hunger is anymore. We should only be eating to actually feed ourselves, right? And that's not the case. So one of the most important habits which we teach our participants is don't eat all the time. <laughs> and we start that off very easily by saying, hey, if you join and if you start a program, you get a coach, a real coach via WhatsApp who will support you throughout the program. And the first, in the first week, you'll just eat three meals per day. You won't have any snacks, right? If you feel like you crave something, then drink water, but you don't need to eat all the time. And in the second week, we slowly progress to um, intermittent fasting, to prolong the um, fasting windows, because if you introduce intermittent fasting to some people, they will actually start to learn the difference between um, emotional eating and real hunger. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that, are super important for someone if they want to unfuck their diet. They need to listen to their body. They have to understand their body better and learn how to listen to their body. And when is it actually emotional? And when is, when is it real? Because most of the times we're eating, it's not real. That hunger is not real. I definitely know the emotional hunger as well. 
<laughs> right. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, I like that a lot. Can you give some more examples of, of habits? Yeah, sure. So um, another example of a habit, well, maybe it's not a habit, but what's super important and what can mess um, with your appetite is when you don't sleep enough, right? So we have a lot of um, bankers who also participate in a program. Right? They're under a lot of uh, pressure. And then they come home, maybe they have kids to take care of. So stress um, plays an important factor. And as you know, Jan, uh, a lot of people speak about sleep deprivation, mm -hmm. uh, etc. So when you don't get enough sleep and when you don't get a good night's sleep and you wake up sleep deprived or always under st stress, your, st your stress hormone cortisol goes up and that makes you tend to grab more unhealthy foods. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it triggers the reward system in our brain, right? It helps us make us feel better. Mm -hmm. It soothes our emotions. Um, and that's something we really uh, look at as well. It's not about just eating better. Our coaches look at what's, their particip what's the participant's stress level. Do they feel highly stressed at the moment? Do they get enough sleep? And if they don't, they will find strategies with them to actually decrease the stress level and get more sleep. For example, would it be meditation, breathing, or what, what are these strategies to decrease the stress level? Correct. So we have um, a lot of, or a few, proven strategies that we implement or try to implement with the participants because uh, why do I say try because eventually there's only so much we can do but mm -hmm. the participant always have to do the rest themselves of course yes. right we can only give the tools and the encouragement and this is very important to understand we have to we don't have to all in one solution but we are the facilitator mm -hmm. and one way we try to facilitate things is by giving examples of what people can do. And that's, as you said, doing um, a small meditation in evening. If people are not too much into meditation and woo-woo stuff, uh, they can just go for a walk, of course, to clear their mind. There are other ways to do it, like don't look at your phone at least one hour before going to bed. Mm -hmm. Also decrease the blue light. Um, also black out your, your room, darken out your room or cool the temperature down um, or do a journaling, right? Um, a lot of times when we cannot fall asleep, it's just because we have a lot of things on our head. And if we get those things out on paper or into an app, um, then we clear our minds, of course. And then this will um, help us sleep, fall asleep a lot quicker. Yeah. I think uh, the things you mentioned, I probably do almost all of them. <laughs> Great, fantastic. <laughs> Together, and I sleep good, I have to say. <laughs> But I also wake up at five o'clock in the morning, so I'm really tired in the evening and have no problems to fall asleep. Sure, I mean, waking up early in the morning um, is actually a, a good way to <laughs> get yourself into bed again early. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But um, again, I think it also depends. It's very individual, right? Um, some people, depending on their circadian rhythm, some people do better sleeping in. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people do better waking up early. So if you can wake up early, I really think it's, it's great to have that start, that quietness in the morning. However, I've listened to a lot of motivators and motivational speakers um, a Navy ex Navy SEAL commanders in the past, like Jocko uh, Willink, yes. um, they always say like, "Hey, you have to join the 4:45 a.m. club. You have to get up at 4:45 a.m. and go do a workout." You know, if you cannot get go to bed early enough, it doesn't make sense to wake up at 4:45 a.m. because people still need sleep. Yes. I absolutely agree. If you, there are people who go up, go to bed at one, they have no chance to to join the 5 a.m. club if they want to stay healthy. I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, um, good. I mean, we could talk about those habits for a long time, but uh, I also would like to know um, what. So you built up two businesses. You 
you followed your passion, you are independent. It's it's already a, bre a dream for many people. But right now, you how, what is your age? I'm 37. 37 years old. So what is your vision now for you? Do you have like a, a goal, a dream, which you want to reach in the next years, maybe in the next five years? Yeah, sure. So I think on the business side, uh, I'm not there where I want to be because I want to help millions of people, of course. Um, and on the personal side, and maybe that's also kind of um, business related, but on the personal side, of course, the older I get, um, the, the health, the, the more I want to stay healthy and be even healthier or get even healthier, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a very common goal for um, a lot of people. And so how can I do that? I do that through constant, like never ending um, search for the right therapy because I have um, a small uh, muscular issue since my um, knee accident that I had 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on a constant search to find the right um, therapy for me. And I think the one of the grand goals would be just to walk pain free one day again. Mm -hmm. So, um, what do you, do you already have uh, through the tests you do you did? Do you have like an idea if this would be um, if you reach this by uh, physical training or if you reach this by some I don't know med medical um, treatment? I don't know. Uh, there's people who do stem cell therapy or what? Do you have an idea how you can reach this? Yeah, that's a good question. So from what I've learned about stem cell, I think this is something that I would definitely do not for my uh, current problem, but maybe um, just to prevent future problems, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think I would travel to Panama to one of the uh, most advanced stem cell uh, institutes there to get my stem cells um, uh, taken from me or taken mm -hmm. out and, and frozen and just have story there, you know, <laughs> who knows what happens in the future. Mm -hmm. um, for my specific problem at the moment, what helps is if I continuously do a routine and I think routines are super important and a lot of people think routines take a lot of time but i think to be effective you have to be more efficient right mm -hmm. so if you, i think a lot of people because i work with a lot of high performers right like um, high level managers and uh, entrepreneurs such as yourself and everyone wants to perform at their best but to perform at their best You also have to take care of your health. And one way to do that is through physical training, right? Keeping your body healthy, um, keep, keeping the blood flowing and preventing or um, reversing um, or avoiding pain, back pain, knee pain, whatever that is. And a lot of people also have the misconception that it takes a lot of time um, in the day to do that, to take care of your body or follow routines, which is not quite true it all depends on how you do it if you look at the uh, malcolm gladwell principle of 10,000 hour he yes. says that it takes 10,000 hours to become perfect at something right then um what's interesting is tim ferris also spoke in a podcast about that and as you know tim ferris also always looks to how can he become good at something within a shorter amount of time and so he said about the malcolm gladwell principle that it's not that It takes 10,000 hours of practice to become perfect. It takes hours and hours of good practice or perfect practice to become perfect, right? So it's not that you can do any kind of practice and then it will take 10. Well, maybe if you do the average type of practice, let's say you want to learn a language, right? And maybe it takes you 10,000 hours to learn mandarin or spanish the traditional way if you found out a better way to learn uh, those languages 
then it will take you less than 10,000 10, hours to, uh, to become a perfectionist. Yes, so, so we can, I think we can say the 10,000 hour principle works, but it's hackable. It's totally hackable, right? And I think the way to achieving all of our goals or all, at least all of my goals is trying to find hacks. Like how can I um, shortcut um, this, even if someone says it, take, it would take me this and this um, to do that, I would say, I would try to question everything that I hear. Um, if I go to a doctor and he says that, I would just go on to the next doctor and, 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 and see how can I um, shortcut a way to health. Can you give some examples of hacks you found uh, which you successfully tried on yourself or on your, um, on your clients? Well, one simple hack is, of course, um, the, one of the greatest misconceptions and, and objections that I hear from a lot of people why they cannot um, stay in shape, let's stick to training, why they cannot stay in shape is I don't have time, mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure you've heard that many times for mm -hmm. yourself or maybe you've said that yourself many times. In the past I did, yes, not anymore. In the past, right. Mm -hmm. now, but now you're uh, <laughs> a lot more efficient. So <laughs> it's all about efficiency. If someone says, I don't have time, well, what does that mean? Do they have five minutes per day? Do they have 10 minutes every two days? Um, that they probably have, right? But they, what they really mean is I don't have time to go to the gym and work out for one hour per session. Who said that it takes you one hour, right? Nobody said that, but that's in the minds of many people. Mm -hmm. However, if you go to the gym every day and just did 10 pull-ups, that's even way better than just doing nothing that week. Mm -hmm. And 10 pull-ups maybe cost you, well, depends on how fit you are, of course, um, maybe takes you anywhere from 30 seconds to uh, three minutes, right? But let's say it takes one less than five minutes and five, less than five minutes per day or every second day, which will result in, let's say you do go every day uh, and do 10 pull-ups per day. That's already 70 pull-ups that you did that week. Instead of telling your, yourself the excuse, I don't have time. Very interesting. So let's, let's do an example. I don't know if you, if it's possible, but let's just try. So for the normal um, middle age um, office person um, who, who might be a bit overweight, has some back pain, uh, but not, not no huge problems. To get in real good shape, uh, physically uh, healthy, also no fat anymore on the body, um, no pain. What do you think is necessary if, if they really take a very efficient program? How, how many minutes they need per day? Well, if we're talking about physical training, yeah. then it's definitely like from, from our um, experience, people should start with something that it's, that is um, achievable to them and is realistic. So what do I mean by that? What's very unrealistic and not sustainable is if same, same as with dieting, if they go from zero to a hundred mm -hmm. and try to do it perfectly, it's not sustainable. I've seen that over and over again, right? But what's sustainable is, can you give me 10 push-ups tomorrow morning? Most people will say yes, right? And once they've done that, you ask them for another 10 push-ups the following day, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe every day they did 10 push-ups. So maybe for that person, that person that you just described, you have to, maybe it's not push-ups, right? Maybe it's air squats or whatever. You just have to find something that they are willing to um, commit to. That's so the first step. Even, even, so even with a five-minute uh, workout per day, you could get them on the track. Yes, because as I said in the beginning, yeah. um, the start is the hardest and you have to mm -hmm. create that momentum. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, for, like, it's hard to get people to, to start and to create that momentum for themselves if you give them a task which is very, very hard to do. 
which takes maybe 30 to 45 minutes, and you ask them, you're asking them to do that several times per week. If they're already stressed and have very little time, it's very unrealistic. So set realistic um, small steps. Great. I think that was um, that was a really interesting um, talk about habits and also about your way. I would love to invite you again uh, before we wrap this up. Could you give us uh, some information where we can find you on the web, uh, on social media? If somebody's interested in your programs, how can we find you, Tommy? Sure. So you can find us at eatbetternotperfect.com. And that's also our social media handle. And for uh, trainings, it's unlimited.ch. So U N L M T D.ch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's basically unlimited without the I, without the E. Great. And uh, so you offer um, custom made programs, individual coaching, one on one, and also like you said, uh, cooperations with companies like, like banks, etc. Correct. So we have uh, corporate programs, we have individual programs, we have uh, group programs and um, everything. We have great coaches. That's <laughs> also very important to say, right? So uh, we really invest a lot of time in training our coaches and uh, only hiring the coaches with the right mindset. Perfect. Um, so the last thing I want to ask you is because you mentioned that when I asked you about your vision uh, for the future that you would like to have far more people, you want to have millions, billions of people. Uh, why is that? Why, why, what is different uh, if you uh, have 10 people and make them very happy beings or have millions of people? Well, I think if I help 10 people, it's very easy to attain uh, that goal, right? To achieve that goal. So what happens after those 10 people? Um, but to truly answer that question, I think everyone has to first look inside themselves and ask them what gets them out of bed or what actually fulfills their heart. And one of my ways to fulfill my heart is whenever I can help someone. Um, or someone um, really thanks me uh, for having helped them in whatever way. And this doesn't have to be a life-changing um, thing. It can just be, you know, helping an, an older woman across the street, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you, can, if you can make someone's day, or let's say if you can really contribute create value in someone else's life then that's the ultimate fulfilling to me mm -hmm. and that's why i want to have that day by day and that's how i get to the millions of people i understand um but let's say when you uh, help a woman over the street or you have your clients you work with you can see it and they can thank you personally so you get this uh, emotions from them, which you just described. But when you have millions of people, then there will come a time when not everybody uh, who is grateful can express this gratefulness to you because you might not even be able to read all those social media comments. Do you think there's still a way to, to receive this energy back? Oh, well, that's a good question. I'm not a heavy social media user. And um, we have coaches, of course, who... Um, take care of our Eat Better Not Perfect participants. Um, but I do actually read the feedbacks on a regular basis that we get. Mm -hmm. And we also look at the before and after pictures and, and uh, talk to them personally about how their lives changed. And when, like, I don't think you need to hear each in, like individual feedbacks one by one, but just enough so that gets you going for days and days and weeks and weeks. Yeah. I, I actually thank you, Tommy, for our interview today. It gave me great insights. You actually helped me today because uh, you gave me more insights in uh, how I can improve on my daily habits and on my health. That's also a thing which I'm pursuing every day. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for giving a lot of value information, valuable information to our listeners. I'm glad I could help. 
Great. So thank you for this talk. Uh, I hope you will come in the future again and have a great day, Tommy. Thanks. You too, Jan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.